Hey everybody, this is Adam Kokesh here with Coronaphobia Day 4. Thank you so much for joining us. I am Libertarian Party presidential candidate Adam Kokesh. Getting casual today, I don't know if you've noticed, we've gotten progressively more casual as we have gone, as I think the general attitude is appropriately adjusting to the reality setting in of what we are facing here with this manufactured crisis. So we are here in No Force One on the road somewhere in Illinois. We just crossed over into Illinois from uh, from Indiana, and we are on our way to our bug out spot. And now, it's not because I'm afraid of the coronavirus or we're afraid of uh, of spreading it because that's already been done. It's already out there. Uh, people who who need to take care of themselves should be taking care of themselves. But uh, this is this is a really interesting time to be alive, and we are seeing that the government response to this uh, manufactured crisis is more doing more harm than good. So uh, Ryan Ramsey says, "Don't cough on the camera. I will say well." <coughs> and about that, we have a bit of a personal update here. First, with our friend Joshua Smith. Uh, candidate for Libertarian National Committee Chair, someone who I'm supporting, I've endorsed in this race. And uh, apparently when he got home from Illinois this weekend, uh, Dave, sorry, David and Sam are with us. David has some, what? <laughs> well, I, I was just saying, I don't know if I would uh, mention that. <laughs> oh, what, what, that, what, that we got it in Illinois? Oh, 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 yeah. Oh, did, oh, was I want not supposed to mention that we got it? Oh, oh, no, but uh, what, no, that, that, that Joshua got it in Illinois? Uh, yeah, I mean, just what, what I was talking about with Josh was, uh, you know, over text, I, you know. Oh, so it might be, although well, he's, he's come out public, and he's, he's, he's okay, made okay. public posts yeah, about I, this. I, I know that he was. Yeah, we're not, we're not betraying uh, Joshua I, I, Smith's privacy. Like Josh has the... Yeah, right, and we don't know, yeah, we don't know, we don't, we don't, we don't be afraid, um, that you know, oh my God! If you if you were in the same room as Joshua Smith last weekend, you've got cor. I, I, he's doing a lot better. Oh, he's already doing better. Oh yeah, yeah. Like it was no big deal. Right. No, you know what? And I, I I will make fun of my friend Josh here for just just a second here, and he made an important point on Facebook. Uh, you know, it's possible to say. Yes, the government is overreacting, and yes, this is a bigger threat, and this still constitutes a legitimate health emergency. You don't have to go one or the... You don't have to choose. You can have your cake and eat it, too, or have your corona and drink it, too. But he is uh, actually dealing with, with flu-ish symptoms, and uh, as, as a bit of a more personal update here... Wait, I'm not done making fun of Josh, because what Josh needs to be made fun of for is that it seems he might have had a bit of a moment of weakness in in his feverish delirium state that's is that exaggerating that's definitely exaggerating but he he had a moment of i'm sorry i downplayed this and uh i i don't think that's that's really appropriate right now because just a little bit of perspective shows that this should be downplayed uh this is being played up this is being played up to our detriment, to the benefit of government, to the benefit of power and money and martial law and, and all of the things that we see the government is doing now in response. And I'll say it again, what I said yesterday, that the obvious power grab here isn't about any kind of conspiracy theory. It's happening in the open. The only thing that, that's sort of theoretical here is how much of this was planned in advance. Now. There are all sorts of conspiracy theories around this, as with any large, significant, complex event of this nature. Was the virus a bioweapon? Was it started by the Chinese government? Was it started by the American government? David here thinks that, that he got the coronavirus in November and that he gave it to someone who gave it to China, and that's how it blew up. He's patient zero. Um, but no, so here's, here's the thing. Like, there is, there is a legitimate crisis here and people are uh, rightly offended over some of the things that people are saying to say, oh, it's, it's nothing, it's no big deal, who cares, blah, blah, blah. You know, and, and I would say, if we're gonna put this in the same category as a bad flu season in terms of what kind of health crisis this represents, and I think that's fair, categorically, this is on par with a bad flu season. And it might be a little bit worse than normal, it might be a little bit milder than normal, but you know, we don't know yet, that's okay. And 
if someone was, uh, you know, in the hospital with the flu, or it was a bad flu season, and and we were making light of it and and making light of the real suffering, that would be inappropriate. Absolutely. So, oh my gosh, ha ha, your your grandpa got the flu and is in a in the hospital on a respirator. Yeah, you would be an asshole to say something like that. And I don't think that's what anybody in 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 sort of our camp of wanting to de-escalate and demystify this panic uh, are saying none of us are, are are being cruel or callous about the real human suffering that's happening here. However, it is still critically important that we put it in perspective. And that means weighing the actual costs of the potential a viral pandemic with the very real and now obvious undeniable costs of the paranoia pandemic, the propaganda pandemic. Uh, Shane Newsom, nice beard. They made me shave mine. Grr. Uh, thank you, Shane. I don't know if that's a, a rep- uh, is that a Corona thing? Get better shave your beard so it's more sanitary so you're less likely to get the coronavirus right. Uh, Stephen Powell, did you catch the president president's announcement today? when talking to the press, that he will take equity in companies that take the government bailout. I, I missed that. Um, yeah. Uh, not he, but the, oh, the government will take, oh, the government will take equity? Oh, really? So now that share prices are super depressed, the government's going to buy low, scoop these things up, and we'll have further nationalization of industry here in the United States. Yes. Big surprise. Um, Adams, this is from Ryan Ramsey. What do you say on my theory that the government is behind Corona to kill the old and make Social Security solvent? (laughs) No, no. Now, that's that's an interesting conspiracy theory there. And I think when we see an event as, as complex as this, there are a lot of corrupt forces that are going to have some play in this. There are going to be people who have the incentive of old people dying. It's not that significant, though. And again, I, I go back to the numbers. Like, let's look at the numbers. If you see the uh, of reported cases, the fatality rates, it's pretty disturbing. I would make the case, however, that even that is fear-mongering blown out of proportion because uh, the obvious... Uh, thing that everybody's talking about is there are way more people out there who have this, who are spreading it than have ever been tested. And we don't know how widespread it is uh, until we see uh, testing done in random samples, general population, and we know what's really out there. But this this big number, when we see like, oh, 0.202% risk or 0.2% going going around, and then it's, you know, scales up to, you know, if you're 80 plus you have a 15.3 percent chance of dying from coronavirus. Okay, if this was the government's master plan, Mr. Ramsey, to cull the old people in America, I would think they could create a better bioweapon, first of all, than one that kills 15.4 percent of people over 80 who seek treatment. That's that's the group that we're talking about. That's what that number is. You have to look at the, no, the, 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 the top number and the bottom number in any fraction here. That denominator, divide by the number of cases that are out there. Divide by the number of people, 80 plus, who have been exposed to this. Probably didn't even notice that they got it. And that number comes way, way down. And now you're talking probably something that is less deadly than the flu. And that's that makes things really scary in that it's showing that government can fuck things up really bad for everyone on the flimsiest of excuses with little to no proof of what they're saying is a threat. Yeah, there's evidence. Is there proof? No, not right now. And I got to do a a bit of an update here on what uh, we did. Let's see, today's Thursday. On Tuesday, we read the Ron Ron Paul article called The Coronavirus Hoax. And I had to point out, yes, I think he got that title for me. I did a, a video a podcast actually about a month ago now calling it the coronavirus hoax. And it's not like, again, if people are scared and, and, and people are reacting out of fear. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of the coronavirus. Be afraid of your government. You have a lot of reasons to be afraid of your government. And now it's a collaboration with social media and the mainstream media, even Twitter which you know I had assumed was relatively good on on not censoring things is censoring coronavirus posts very disturbing because 
it means that the only information that's getting out there is the government approved information and that leads to a whole other host of scary possibilities but on Facebook where I posted this article from Ron Paul it said must read from Dr. Paul on the coronavirus it got taken down and it didn't just got get taken down it, it got uh, I got a message that says this is this is misinformation and I took a screenshot of this so if you if you want to go uh, to my Twitter account twitter.com slash at Adam Kokesh I posted that there and it's uh, really disturbing someone tried to blow this off as a glitch and oh well Facebook employees are working from home so you know they're, they're not able to to filter stuff it was just a glitch no it wasn't a glitch in this case they actually had an article from some fact checker website saying Ron Paul's statements in that article were incorrect and I read the analysis it's bullshit Ron Paul's statement that they took particular issue with was that the death rate has no basis in scientific fact. And that is true, although it gets a little subjective. Is it scientific if we have preliminary numbers? If we're making estimates, it could be an informed guess, uh, an educated guess, and, and a scientific estimate, perhaps. But no basis in scientific fact. And this is coming from Dr. Ron Paul. And so on that basis, they took down his entire story from all over Facebook. You couldn't post it without it getting taken down. I haven't tried reposting it. I did repost it, however, on Twitter and said this has been taken down and it's all the more important that this information get out there. So what I'm doing now with all of my social media presence with these daily lives now, as long as it's necessary to combat coronaphobia, is to spread that basic message that Ron Paul put out, that this is overblown, that this is a relatively minor health threat, and that the bigger threat here comes from government so one other personal update we got to get to um i think we have it i, I mean I'm, from the way we were traveling uh and and the symptoms that we have experienced i don't know could be a minor cold but um my my wife samantha who's who's actually resting in the back right now as we do this who uh normally would be joining us looking at your comments and feeding me questions uh she's got a bit of a flu and it's it's a weird flu. It's not. Uh, she doesn't have the dry cough yet, but uh, she's got some fatigue, sore throat, which is very distinct, and uh, just and, and some joint soreness. But from uh, what we've heard, even just now, with um, libertarian patient one, Joshua Smith, <laughs> David, David, of course, being patient zero, uh, that that he was able to recover relatively quickly and I'm very confident that for most people who get this it's they're not even going to notice and if you look at the, again do the math and I, I want to address there's one other big bit of the fear mongering here and, and by the way I did a, a tweet that went viral uh, yesterday or last night um, I wish I could repeat it verbatim here but it was Iraq has WMDs mission accomplished the TSA is here to keep you safe government cares about you um the gulf of tonkin was an attack on the u.s out of the there's a list of the the most like iconic obscene u.s government lies that have led to thousands of unnecessary deaths uh obviously if you don't know the gulf of tonkin incident look it up that was how the american people were lied to about Vietnam saying that the US military was attacked and that justified the escalation in the war there. But the last one of these lies was, you need to give up your civil liberties to keep from getting COVID-19. And the obvious lies are in the way that this is being overblown. And we're gonna be able to call people out later. I wonder if it's gonna do any good. And you know, I've said this before, the one thing we learn from history is that we never freaking learn from history. Although, I would like to point out that for all the recent saber rattling regarding Iran and potentially starting a war with Iran, when that was going on a few months ago, people were pretty quick to bring up, hey, all these people are saying we need a war with Iran are the ones who were saying that we needed a war with Iraq. Maybe, maybe institutional knowledge in the age of the internet, rather social memory and, and, and a sense of history is getting better and better. And we're gonna remember this and we're gonna say, look, we're gonna learn this lesson. And the lesson is that government is the biggest threat in a situation like this and nothing they say justifies you giving up your civil liberties. So um, 
Joshua McCose, I just sent you a patent for treatment for coronavirus on your phone, Adam. Thank you. All right, lots of comments here. David is watching, and we'll be getting to your uh, your critical uh, comments and questions here. Okay, wait. Chris Cole says, I caught that wife comment. It was fiancé yesterday. Hey, I call her what she wants to be called. That's that's how this works. Um, if if yeah, she, right, you never right. call her. Yeah, <laughs> and I just yell from the front. Hey, hey, over here. Um, uh, yeah, and if you want uh, six words to save any marriage, you're right. I'm wrong. I'm sorry. That's it. Say it over and over again. You're right. I'm wrong. I'm sorry. Uh, but hey, David has to take a break here because I think the the water should be filled up. We are actually at a Love's Travel Stop, and we have water running into the RV right now. So uh, David is taking care of that. Um, there's Sam. Mwah, hey, baby. I heard those magic uh, you know those magic words. See, if you if you just say I'm right, I'm you're right, I'm wrong, I'm sorry. Uh, women just appear in your life out of nowhere like magic. It's amazing these these simple magic words. Uh, but but to the, there's there's one other element of fear that that is holding me back from just full on screw the government this is all nonsense bullshit get over it because there is one hypothetical co consequence here that that may be significant so I, if anybody wants to pick apart the numbers on this uh, i would really appreciate it i just listened to npr's interview with uh new york governor um Qu is it cuomo or de blasio i forget which is mayor and which is governor all these all these statist tyrants in the making talking heads just kind of blur together from me uh so it was the governor of new york was was on uh on npr on one of their podcasts and was making the numerical case for the shortage in hospital beds that we're going to have a wave we need and this is this is the argument not for for anything other than you know like like flatten the curve right that if there's going to be a spike in cases that could overwhelm the healthcare system um and if that's the case okay we got a real crisis here get government out of the way get government out of the way. i don't know how many times i can say that but it is coming out always a few days later than it's relevant like with the testing that uh, it, it was it was Trump's decisions that made it harder for test kits to get out here. Now, from everything I've seen, the testing kind of futile. It's really only relevant for people who are experiencing severe symptoms and uh, are looking for specific treatment for that. And even then, largely irrelevant because a hospital sees, okay, you have a viral infection, you have symptoms, we're going to treat you for that. And until there is a distinct treatment for COVID-19, for the coronavirus, even those tests aren't particularly relevant. But what good does it do to say, hey, I don't have any symptoms, I got tested, and what, now I have to quarantine myself for up to 37 days? Because that's potentially how long that this thing may be contagious, even after showing symptoms. And even the governor of New York admitted that the testing phase is over in the sense that as a first line of defense, if we tested people and they were able to isolate themselves or we were able to somehow control the spread of this thing in a meaningful way, that testing would be a critical tool. Well, screw the pooch, that ship has sailed and we are now in scramble for treatment mode if this is really the emergency that we uh, are told it is. And I certainly don't believe that. But the case that the governor was making was that if, if we see this spike in cases, and he was predicting that the peak is going to come in about 45 days. And by the way, uh, David just pointed out from the news just now, New York's cases have doubled overnight. Well, yeah, it's because they figured out their testing situation. They're just testing a lot more people. People are able to go to drive throughs now at different places in the country where you can drive up without without being exposed to any anybody else's germs. They reach in and swab your mouth and take your test and send you home and then let you know later uh, if, if you have coronavirus. And I'm, you know, I'm not... Uh, I, I haven't done those numbers yet, but having done all the other numbers on every other aspect of this scenario, I go, wow, geez, every rock I turn over, it's nothing but bullshit underneath. I'm pretty confident we're going to find bullshit under this rock too. So the 
challenge here is hypothetically, if we peak in cases in 45 days, and um, and this is you know reported cases, I think the case uh, increase is again really because people are getting more aware and they're getting tested and it's being reported and there's a lag on this. This is the other thing that's really important to keep in mind is that however many cases they're telling you are there are today, that's actually really what it was. A week ago, maybe two weeks ago, depending on the testing lag on whatever area they're talking about, if they're talking about globally, it's definitely gone up, way up from whatever they're saying the the global result is. This virus but the has deaths, spread for me to you. Yeah, this. <laughs> <laughs> but the 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 death rate again, when when the number of tests tests go up and we see that way more people have it than have died from it, the the percentage and the death rate goes down, 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 and it's going to go down. I I would bet. Now I'm not here. I'm not I'm not making. Uh, a decisive call as, as any kind of uh, you know you know pandemic or statistics expert uh, or or public health care policy expert but from what it looks like the way the tests are going up the way the confirmed cases are going up and the from what we hear about how viral this is outside of people who have symptoms it looks like if, if, if all those numbers crunch down if they keep going the way they're going when, when, when they calculate the death toll, even in that over 80 and over 70, over 60, those age brackets, you're going to see that it comes down. And from what I can tell, it's going to be less deadly than the flu when things come out here. Uh, could be wrong on that, but it's definitely in that neighborhood. And at some point, people are going to be really, really pissed off. So the idea is that there is a, a impending shortage of hospital beds and ventilators and th this is this is i mean i, I want to give some credence to this threat i'm not being frightened into submission it certainly does not justify the government giving banks trillions of dollars or bailouts for corporations or taking over companies or, or imposing martial law or any kind of restrictions by force and that that much is absolutely clear but is the government going to make this part worse too i mean if anything the potential of a shortage in medical supplies and in, in beds and ventilators is all the more reason for us to say let's get government as far away from this thing as possible so that we can do a better job of taking care of people who might really need it and this is what i've said from the beginning and people have like ignored it because i'm i'm, I'm focusing on the bigger threat here the bigger threat is the government response and, and again this is where i can't make a decisive statistical prediction but I am I am inclined to think that more people are going to die as a result of the economic hardships and the downturns from the quarantines and the, the economic consequences of this. And, of course, all the socialism. I mean, uh, Trump's socialist freak flag is flying loud and proud at this point. Bailouts for companies, bailouts for medical situations, more money for banks, more money for the average American. We're going to send checks to everybody. Uh, no, like this is just going to make the problem worse. But what I've been saying from the beginning is if we had a reasonable response, if we had a president who wasn't a moron, who wasn't subjected to uh, all the political manipulations and whims and everything around him, if, if, if we weren't essentially as a country held hostage by people thousands of miles away in D.C., forcing their will on us. What we would have been able to do is support people who are vulnerable self-quarantining and being we would, would have been able to take care. If everybody quarantines, well, the people who are really vulnerable, they're going to die first. If the people who aren't vulnerable say, hey, I'm going to step up my self-care, I'm going to step up my sanitation a little bit, and then I'm going to uh, I'm, I'm going to go about my life as normal, so that we can take care of people who need it, take care of people in quarantine. If you're in quarantine because because you're elderly or you're immunocompromised and you're really sick, and the rest of the world is going to hell, it's going to be a lot harder for you to get toilet paper delivered and things like that. I don't understand that. Don't understand what? Toilet paper. Yeah, that was that was an, well. It's a virus. <sighs> it's not Chipotle. It's a virus. It's not Chipotle. Get over the toilet paper thing. Uh, oh, what, is that what was? I wasn't like paying attention to the toilet paper thing from the very beginning. It was just kind of like a, a side note for me. Like, oh hey, there's a people are running 
low on toilet paper apparently but was the the, the, was there a diarrhea threat associated maybe with this because, at some point yeah maybe it is but what i want to point out is to everybody that's buying baby wipes you're taking them away from actual infants that really need it so knock it the hell off yeah so i know this is uh, thank you for pointing that out yeah. and, and and that's probably not the biggest problem but that's a great example of unintended consequences from reacting out of fear, overreacting. Yeah. And here, so, so let me break this down, because because what Sam points out here is the baby wipe shortage issue. Yeah. And and this 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 is, is again a relatively minor issue around the margins here. But what if we find out that because of the toilet paper shortage, we caused a baby wipe shortage, and as a result, there was a significant problem for Rashes, for new mothers new moms, being able everything. to take care of their babies. Yeah rashes, infections, maybe the effect of this, yeah, and hurting our children now, hurting hurting babies, is that you're going to have uh, a, a, an increase in sudden infant death syndrome a few months down the road. Uh, certainly with the stress, if you're, if you're a new mother and the country goes into lockdown, it's a stressful enough situation as, as it is with an economy that's basically a house of cards where, you know, most Americans are living paycheck to paycheck already. And then this happens. How much stress does that put on new parents, uh, new mothers and, and, and infants, especially uh, the unintended consequences of this when you don't allow people individually to weigh their own interests and make rational decisions? you're going to make things worse. And just the other thing I'll go back to, uh, you know, from the beginning on this, it was the sequestering of information. It was the lack of transparency. Donald Trump specifically saying, the CDC should conduct its deliberations in secret. Oh, uh, no, are you kidding? This is so, it's, it's you know, we're gonna keep you like a frightened child. We're, we're, gonna, we're gonna keep you locked up. We're gonna, we're gonna put you in your room and say, stay in your room for now. And we're not gonna let you know what's going on. It's definitely gonna make things worse. And we're already starting to see in our snowflake culture, uh, an interesting wave of mental health issues. Yeah, it's stressful. Uh, how many people just lost their jobs? have no idea whether they're coming back when this thing blows over, and it will eventually. So there's there's one big question. Um, I'm gonna ask one more big question here, and, and I want people to chime in and help me figure this out. Um, so I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, lay this out, and then while people are thinking about this, maybe doing some numbers, looking up their, their statistics, trying to figure out where this is going. Here's the big question, right? Because the, Curve, let's, see, let's say that society, American society, is sort of trucking along at level stasis. Now, obviously, there's a lot of up and downs. There are all sorts of variables, but let's just let's just neutralize those zero and say that the general course uh, of American life was flat, and then there was an uptick in bad shit happening. And of course, the coronavirus was was part of this. The government reaction was part of this. The panic reaction was part. Of this. Really, the coronavirus was just a little bit of it. It's these other things that are escalating things. So here's the question. Does this escalation of bad shit happening, does this trajectory, does it accelerate? Does it get worse? Because the numbers are as the test kits get out there, but that's not really what we're measuring here, right? We're talking about the, the upheaval and, and, and cost to the American people. So there, there are a couple possibilities here. I'll just show you how this, how this curve could play out different ways, right? It could accelerate. It could get way worse. It could uh, lead to nuclear war. Everything blows up. Okay, so, that, so that's like the extreme acceleration of the bad shit curve. Uh, a, a possibly more reasonable uh, course for the bad shit curve is that as bad as things are getting, the, the, the rate of acceleration here is, is going to stay more or less constant and things will keep getting worse the way they're going for quite some time and I you know I of course my long-term projection we're achieving a voluntary society one way or another this isn't going to slow down that bigger process if anything it'll accelerate and I'll tell you why later but we see this potential this potential see I don't I, I think that that extreme acceleration really unlikely not in the age of the internet not with so many Americans paying attention and questioning things now already saying uh, maybe the cure is worse than the disease I don't think government is gonna get away with that much of an acceleration but maybe uh, maybe it continues 
getting worse on this trajectory, maybe we get more lockdowns. Maybe we get more restrictions on medical care. Maybe we get more economic interventions. Maybe we get a lot more socialism. Maybe we get a lot more quantitative easing. Maybe we get a lot more government takeovers of businesses. Maybe this even leads to forced vaccinations. And that's a realistic, very scary possibility if the bad shit keeps getting worse. Now, mandatory vaccinations coming out of this could happen anyway, even if things don't keep going on this upwards trajectory of bad shit. So then there are a few ways that this levels off. Maybe it keeps getting bad for a while. Maybe after 45 days it levels off, you know, according to uh, the New York governor's estimate of, of when the peak in cases is going to be. But it's going to keep on this pretty solid bad shit accelerating trajectory until we get to a clear peak in cases and come past it and then things start getting back to normal. Now, I'm a little bit more optimistic. Here's my projection that I now I, I think all of these are realistic possibilities. But what I think is most likely is you're going to see things start to level off. I think already the American people are getting pissed. And when we realize how much we've been frightened into giving up over so little, we're going to be really pissed. I, again, like with Iraq and WMDs, I hope the next time they try to scare us into something like this, we go, hey, it's the same assholes that lied us into coronaphobia who are trying to lie us into Ebola phobia too, or whatever the next viral thing is. So my prediction, uh, and again, not, not a set in stone, this is what's going to happen, but what I think is the most likely scenario for how this progresses is that you're going to see uh, you're going to see the, 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 the bad shit starting to level off now, but it's going to keep going up un until we get to some kind of natural peak in the progression of this, or we get a vaccine, or we get some kind of reliable treatment. And there are already some drugs, some antivirals, malaria treatments that, that are getting... Um, that are, that are getting uh, tested right now. Uh, just since Cherith uh, yeah. Premawarhana writes, are we afraid of martial law? Well-timed question there. Yeah, that's the bigger fear. Now, I don't think that they're ever going to be able to drum this up into an excuse for true full-scale martial law. But what we're seeing already, martial law around the edges, a soft shutdown, partial martial law, things like that. Yeah, that's that's the real threat. And it's not, oh, you're going to have some suffering. But the long-term repercussions economically, socially, and, and, and all the other ways that we relate to government, those are going to be the real harmful effects. Although, if we come out relating to government with more skepticism, that would be a good thing. So, then we'll, we're, I think we're going to see this. We're going to see this this trajectory of bad shit kind of come down, and and the importance of this is that if it's if it's 45 days, that's a month and a half. Well, Libertarian National Convention coming up end of May. It's really going to be on the cusp, I think, you know, as things are coming down. And it's really important for libertarians to say, we will not be intimidated. We will not be frightened into submission. If you say we can't meet in large groups, we're going to do it anyway. And that kind of defiance in times of crisis is all the more critical. So there's an even more optimistic curve that, that David was actually uh, pointing out is, is a realistic possibility here as well. That, you know, as bad as things are right now, they, they might, there might be a, a sudden return to normalcy. There might be a, a sudden turn back to, uh, to, to, to sanity. Although, even if that's the case, the tail of this curve uh, of the economic repercussions is going to be bad regardless. What's already happened, just the disruption we've experienced economically, is obviously going to be with us for a long time. So to, to David's point, to the, the super optimistic curve that things really start coming down quickly here, you know, there is the chance that uh, th that we get that, and and I'm that's what I'm hopeful for. That there's some you know r really easy treatment, and the fatality rate among the the elderly and immunocompromised who are significantly affected by this comes down to, to normal uh, uh, or comes down to next to zero. But um, we'll come back to that. So let's take a few minutes now and get to some questions. Sam, you got anything uh, standing out for you in the crowd? Uh, actually, I was just reading Stephen Powell's comment. Um, if Adam's the only one that shows up, 
If Adam's the only one that shows up at the LP National Convention, does that mean he gets the nomination? <laughs> <laughs> hey, can you guys hear Sam okay when she's talking back there? Do you need her to, to speak up or get closer to the mic? Her. Oh, <laughs> so okay. Everybody can bite me. My throat hurts. So the question: Well, you can sit right here, baby. Yeah. So she's got coronavirus and she has a sore throat. So we have to be accommodating for her weakened voice and, and oh, invite her Shut to sit uh, closer to the camera here. So the question was: If nobody but me shows up at the national convention, that means I get to be the nominee, right? Yeah. And you know, I don't, I don't want to win on an error. You know, I, I want to win because. The Libertarian Party membership, the delegates at National Convention, realized that I'm the best candidate for the job because I have the best platform. Not because of who I am. Everyone I'm an adequate messenger, but that localization is the way forward for freedom, for the Libertarian Party, and for uniting all Americans around this message. So, I would also ask for you to maybe explain the process the, La the Libertarian Party will be doing because the conventions are getting canceled right now. How are we going to be voting in nominees? What do you have to say to the delegates that yeah. need to know how they're going to be voting? Yeah, well, first, my if I may, I think, first explain our, our logistical mm -hmm. situation with this because we were supposed to go into New York on Friday for an interview with uh, Milo Yiannopoulos and Larry Sharp. Uh, Milo is, is not going to let us phone it in, Larry will, um, but we decided that going to New York right now, while it might be fun, um, that the risk of getting trapped there was, was too significant, and there is, excuse me, again, in this, in this, you know, projection of, of bad shit, uh, there is a very distinct possibility right now, as things just get a little bit worse, that there will be uh, significant restrictions on interstate travel. And they say, if it's not essential, because the government decides what's essential and what isn't. So, backing up, for people who aren't familiar with the Libertarian Party presidential nominating process, it is done by convention. That is a thousand delegates coming together every four years representing the state affiliate organizations of the Libertarian Party at our national convention get to decide. They are all what the old parties would call superdelegates, unbound they can vote for whomever they like and this is why we've been recruiting people and making sure that we can't have another Gary Johnson I say that with the disclaimer I love Gary friend of mine absolute man of integrity but also absolutely the wrong approach for the LP and he only won the nomination in 16 because he was able to fill a bunch of empty seats now we have been going around the last two years recruiting people to be delegates for the Libertarian Party to make sure that we don't have that vulnerability ever again. And we succeeded up until coronaphobia, and perhaps even in coronaphobia, we, we may maintain our, our near perfect record of every state convention having a competitive delegate process, no empty seats. And we saw that in, uh, in Illinois where they had, uh, it was a fun story by the way, they had 37 slots, have. And only 22 people signed up, and I was I was invited uh, to, to get up and speak briefly, and said, "Look, you got to fill these slots. People will help you get there. Doesn't matter if you can't afford it. People in this room who care about the Libertarian Party will help you get there to make sure that whoever the nominee of the Libertarian Party is in 2020, it's someone who represents this message with integrity, represents the grassroots of the party, and we don't get another washed-up Republican for a nominee." So. Going to Austin, that's where we're looking at doing this with about a thousand delegates, May 21 to 25. And I know the LNC is having uh, an emergency meeting to d discuss this specifically coming up. I think it's on the 26th, although I don't know if we, if we have any LNC members in the chat. If you want to chime in here, I would appreciate that. And they're looking at contingency plans, different things we could do because we're kind of in a bind with our bylaws having not made the uh, possibility uh, or, or not given us a, 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 uh, an agreed upon plan for uh, conducting party business if we have to do it remotely, if we're not able to meet in person. It's kind of dictated that we do meet in person. And I believe we're going to be able to do this. Uh, I have no doubt that by then, uh, you know, a lot of libertarians and I will say it's a little, a little, little disturbing to see that, that you know we have a lot of libertarians who are new here, who are new to the movement, new to skepticism, new to questioning government perhaps, and they're buying into the fear. 
and it, it, it really is kind of sad. But uh, even for those libertarians, you know, we have to be strong. Those of us who know better, who have a better historical perspective on these kinds of things, say, look, calm down. Let's focus on the real problem here. It's still government. Government is still the biggest threat in this situation. And I'm very confident that uh, those voices of fear in, in the Libertarian Party, um, and, and, and I'll say people I respect, people like I like Brian Ellison, who, who has uh, been very critical of, of my message so far in, in focusing on the right threat here and making sure that we deal with the biological threat appropriately without an overreaction that makes it worse. I'm, I'm certain that uh, you know people who are smart enough to, to be libertarians in the first place generally are going to be smart enough to figure out, uh, at least given a little time, that this, this is a hoax. Uh, the, the threat of the coronavirus is a hoax. Um, obviously, I'm not saying the virus itself isn't real um, or, or that there's some great conspiracy here, but the obvious conspiracy in the open is that government conspires to take your rights to rip you off on behalf of its corporate sponsors. There's no question that that's the conspiracy that government is, and it is certainly alive and well in taking advantage of the corona crisis, coronaphobia, propaganda pandemic. And with the convention in Austin in May, there's a distinct possibility that the mayor of Austin is going to say, no, you can't do that because he's already canceled South by Southwest, already banned large gatherings. Who knows what the state of this soft martial law is going to be in Austin two months from now. And I want to say that we should go anyway. And I'll say again what I said yesterday to Nick Sarwark and the rest of the LNC. Do not be afraid. Show real leadership. If the threat here is lies that make people afraid, we have to be brave and show other people how to be brave and to show them that we will not be coward. We will not be intimidated. We will stand up to this tyranny even in the face of bullshit bio crisis threats. If we have to meet in civil disobedience for the national convention, we should do it anyway. And I will be there regardless. I will be in Austin in May. And what we're doing right now, like I said about not going to New York, we are going to a continentally centrally located bug out spot where we're going to be able to keep spreading this message and keeping an eye on things where we're going to have good internet and uh, just reliable utilities. Uh, we're going to be parking the RV at a house so that, um, by the way, this is a secret location for now. And it's not because, oh, we're going to some secret squirrel stuff, but our hosts uh, don't want anybody to know that I'm going to be there or that that's where we're going to be broadcasting from for a number of obvious security reasons. So uh, if you do want to join us, though, there is a possibility. We are going to be somewhere centrally located. You can email me, adam at thefreedomline.com. This is a really important time, and our campaign is getting uh, a lot more volunteer offers than we've gotten in the past, not only because hey, it's 2020, it's March, shit's getting real, we're getting close to the election, but because people are especially pissed off right now. There are a lot of people out of work for no good reason whatsoever who are fucking livid, and rightly so, and they want a place to channel that, and I hope that our campaign proves to be a righteous way to channel that anger towards productive ends. So... That's uh, does that answer all those aspects of the question there, Sam? Pretty much. All right. What else we got? Um, I did want to let everybody know, uh, speaking of everything, um, that the Lancet Medical Journal, which is which is published by French officials, the World Health Organization has advised against taking ibuprofen or any non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like naproxen, aspirin, Advil because they theorize it could exacerbate the symptoms, but um, going into European medical agencies, there's currently no scientific proof on that. <laughs> so, in case you guys see the the internet blowing up with don't take ibuprofen, it, it makes it worse. There's actually no scientific basis. It will give you kidney damage, but that's regardless. You're going to use it. It's going to happen, but for those who do want to better safe than sorry, this uh, Tylenol and anything with acetaminophen. So NyQuil and DayQuil will help all your cold and flu symptoms still will be fine. Yeah, so be cautious there. It's good to insert a little actual health note in, in the midst of all this. But as, as Sam pointed out, no scientific basis, probably just some anecdotal evidence. 
from people who are dealing with this, right? And I, I, again, again, I want to point out just part of the nature of, of the hysteria and how this is happening. Um, you know, I, I, I saw some headlines on Drudge Report today that were uh, disappointingly sensationalistic. Of course, everybody in the media, you know, wants to uh, to, to sensationalize things and, and, and blow up the risk. But one of them was like a quote from a doctor. Uh, I've never seen anything like this. And it was like, you know... The, you get a quote from a doctor who's worked at a hospital three years and goes, oh my gosh, I've never seen anything like this. We have more patients than we've ever had. And it and, and the, maybe the doctor's totally calm about this, but you take it out of context. It's true. A doctor at a hospital seeing coronavirus patients said, I've never seen anything like this in my entire medical career. And you, yeah, yeah, um, Sam is making masturbation motions uh, <laughs> behind the camera. It took doctors to find a brain tumor in me, so... That's just a PSA, guys. Doctors are people too, and make mistakes, and they do have they do tend to have a god complex about them anyway. Okay, so Seth Davis, any thoughts on red flag laws, the Duncan Lemp situation, and or how this relates to coronaphobia? Whew. Well, first of all, red flag laws are unethical, illegal, unconstitutional. They have no place in a civilized society, and what that is, as anybody who knows or who understands what this means knows that a red flag law is someone's doing something that looks funny so we're going to violate their rights it's uh, presumptive negative justice it is a violation of individual rights and the way that this is manifest is especially dangerous as we learned from the duncan lemp case where he was told or the, the uh, police were told you know oh we got a, an individual a particular individual as they would have said in idiocracy mm -hmm. who's got firearms in his in his residency and so we have to execute a no-knock raid in, in the early morning hours and of course they ended up killing him and then lying about it now what does this have to do with coronaphobia uh, there is a there is a connection here maybe not with the lemp case in particular it's just a, a the lemp case gives us a teachable moment at, at, a, at a particularly relevant time and I think the lesson, the connection really is the, the lesson to be learned here is that when you give government unjustified power, it will be abused. Surprise, surprise. And if that power is to point guns at people and control them and then that they can shoot people without consequences, we see uh, police officers, you take someone out, what do you do? You get paid vacation as a result of that. So what we have to be afraid of here is the potential that that phenomenon is going to get worse under coronaphobia induced martial law and that is a real threat and that is something that everybody should be paying attention to is that if law enforcement behavior changes suddenly and and so far um from our limited experience right sam and, and from from what we've seen anecdotally generally speaking Cops are being more cool yeah. in situations like this, not less. Now, policy-wise, if this leads to more SWAT team raids, that's right. that, or, or, or you know, cops imposing uh, curfews, things like that, and actually getting in physical confrontations with citizens, that might be an issue. But generally speaking, this is one of those times where I think uh, law enforcement gets cooler. Um, it's like, hey, we can't. Yeah, you know, you know all that stuff the politicians told us to do about busting you for weed. Yeah, there's a real threat right now called coronavirus. So we're not. I don't want you to sneeze in, on me or or cough a hit into my face or something like that. So we're just going to leave you alone with that. And I, and I think there's a, a positive effect there. We've seen uh, various prisons around the world in in response to hey, we're not going to lock people up and force them to get sick. Which happened anyway in a lot of prisons before this, but now that it's obvious and undeniable, oh well, let's, let's let out some of the non-violent offenders uh, or, or people who are close to the the end of their sentences. So that's a great thing, and you know what I think of as a as just just to give people a sense of understanding what I'm talking about. I say cops get more cool. Um, I'll, I'll give you a, a sort of anecdotal personal experience that is actually. A, a huge data point because it involves millions of people over decades and that's Mardi Gras in New Orleans. I was really lucky to go there uh, last year after doing the uh, Big Easy book bomb and putting out 200,000 copies of our book Freedom, one in every mailbox in the city of New Orleans and I got to hang out for Mardi Gras and this is a city where cannabis is illegal and during Mardi Gras you walk around, we were smoking joints in front of cops. They don't care. They are they and they have a lot of officers who are deputized, uh, a lot a lot of part timers and, and reserve officers who come in 
just for Mardi Gras for crowd control and they're really legitimately public safety officers at that point uh, they don't do much to enforce victimless crime laws they are really just looking out for public safety and I think one of the things we're seeing now uh, again with this this response from people well, if the government is saying, well, we're going to shut down all non-essential functions. Well, that non-essential function was fucking up my life. It was making a lot of people miserable. You were destroying people's lives every day with the drug war. Now you're saying that whole time that wasn't essential? You know, people are going to be freaking out coming out of this going, mm, yeah, okay, government, we're going to have to talk about what really constitutes essential services because locking innocent people up for cannabis isn't one of them and if you could knock that shit off for corona and the sky didn't fall you're gonna have to knock that shit off for good so i think that's a good thing again that's coming out of this so stephen powell when you talk about cops getting more cool that just shows you're more rational than i am lol thank you for keeping a level head i'm literally angry at the government all the time thanks stephen well <laughs> that's better than being uh, literally passive and complacent all the time. So thank you for tuning in. Yes, and this is a time when we do want to be the cooler heads and say, no, calm down, this isn't it. But at the same time, I do want to get excited and, and, and conf confrontational with the government overreaction. It's not an over... I, I, the words that we're using here aren't even accurate to describe what's happening. This is a power grab. You know, is it, is it an overreaction? Yeah, if you look at it from the perspective of government loves you and is here to protect you, and it just overreacted a little bit because people got scared. No, they saw an, an opportunity to frighten people into giving up their rights. That's what this really is about. All right, so we've only got a, uh, a few minutes here before we get back to this final question about the curve. Sam, David, any other... Uh, burning questions we missed on the on the feed today uh mike arbuckle asked what do you see about trucking speaking of the economy yeah so trucking uh, well you can't deliver toilet paper without a truck so uh the, the trucking industry i i read the, there was again a story on drudge about the challenges that the trucking industry is already facing and this is oh my gosh pennsylvania shut down rest areas like what like you can't it's a it, it's a patch of concrete a big parking lot on the side of the freeway you pull over you rest you know okay so they close the bathroom because they can't maintain fine but they closed all the rest areas and truckers were going what the this is insane we would try the truck do drive they need to pull over and be able to sleep and go you know do drive their next shift when they couldn't do that that was a real problem they decided to open them up so that problem was solved pretty quickly i don't think local and state governments are willing to hurt the people that much to the point of actually impeding truck delivery and getting basic consumer goods to stores. Um, listen to uh, a little bit on the radio and some podcasts about this, people being interviewed, talking about the supply chain. Um, some people were concerned that uh, international shipments are slowing down. Well, when it comes to consumer goods in the United States, toilet paper, wet wipes, food, uh, medicine even, most of that is either locally or regionally produced, certainly most of that within the United States. It's not that much of it that is imported from China or from elsewhere abroad. So the real challenge here is in the immediate uh, trucking logistics supply chain. And I don't see that getting compromised a whole lot more than it is right now. Just thinking about what's the excuse that they've used to shut things down. Well, it's a virus. Well, if you stay in your car, you're going to be fine. Of course, you can get in a truck, you can drive, you can go to a gas station, you know, be careful, be sanitary, you're going to be fine. I don't think they're going to be able to use this to shut down basic consumer function. I don't think they want to. Anything else, Sam? David? Yeah. No? Yeah. Any any good projections? Any any good input from the chat on, on where is this curve of bad shit going? They suspended this is just the rules. Opening act. They suspended rules for enforced rest to let truckers drive more is what Ryan Ramsey just posted. Okay, thank you, Ryan. Yeah, so that's so again, like I think we're seeing those kinds of uh, loosening of restrictions where it's necessary to keep essential services going. Of course it's you know, essential services is what government calls essential. Uh, but what the people demand, 
toilet paper, food, wet wipes, things like that. Uh, those are the real essentials that if you stop people from getting that, if you cut off water and electricity and internet and entertainment and connection and communications, that's when people are going to start getting pissed off and rioting in the streets. I don't think, I'm, I'm pretty confident, again, this is why I think that, that, that sort of acceleration of the curve is uh, pretty unlikely here in the United States because the excuse is not bad enough to justify that. I mean, think about 9-11. That was bad enough to justify the Patriot Act. It was bad enough to justify increasing government powers and surveillance and in secret courts and FISA, Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Authority, or what act, whatever it is. All those things were were stuff that was sort of glancingly related to 9-11 at least. And then, uh, you know, the financial crisis in 2008. Well, we need bailouts, you know, and or we need to spend a ton of money on the military industrial complex, as was the, the actual result uh, of 9-11. Those are the things we have to look out for, those things that are not quite justified, that don't cause immediate obvious harm. If the government says, look, we're able to use this as an excuse to print another trillion and a half dollars to give to our banker friends, well, the American people aren't all of a sudden not going to be able to buy toilet paper. It just means that economic power is going to be further concentrated in the hands of the few. Uh, more people are going to have trouble starting small businesses, getting capital to start small businesses, or just being able to thrive economically in a centrally planned economy as Trump is, um, I was going to say creating for us, but it's more that he's just making worse. So um, if there are no other burning questions here in the chat before we move on. Oh, yeah. Okay, let's hit them. Tim Lightning Allen round. Ma yeah, Tim Allen Matthews uh, posted this. Our mechanic friend. The speed in which the government was able to take over. Do you think that they will ever give up this power now? And how do you combat it seriously? You combat it by waking people up, by spreading the truth and showing them what happens uh, when you give government undue power to take away individual rights. Are they going to give it up uh, eventually? No. It's going to be a slow process. It's going to be like pulling teeth. You could look at uh, the war on drugs as an example of this, right? Where the government, yeah, because libertarians, we just like talking about pot all the time. Uh, no, but the, the, the war on drugs here provides us with a great example where the the threat from the South, marijuana, remember the, the really racially charged term that was used to slander uh, cannabis when they were considering um, prohibition in the first place. And, you know, there were, the motivations then weren't even the pharmaceutical industry so much as the paper industry, and it was to keep hemp out of the American economy on behalf of William Randolph Hearst and the newspaper paper industry that led to that. And they took on an incredible amount of power. They have. The government has taken on, since then, over the last hundred years or so, an insane amount of power keeping cannabis prohibition going. And it has taken this long for us to start unwinding it. So there's kind of a, it's, you know, does anybody ever seize power with the intent of giving it back? Of course not. And once you give it to them, it is very difficult to take it back. But I'm still optimistic for the long run. And while you might go, oh shit, Adam, you're comparing this to cannabis prohibition that was with us for a hundred years, that took us, you know, all this time to to, to get over and, and led to the, the, the you know countless deaths in the, in the drug war and lives ruined in jails and prisons all across this country and businesses shut down and traffic stops and racism, all the things that happen in, in what is not a war on drugs, but a war on the people. How did it, you know, it, is it going to be that bad with all the rights that we end up you know, having taken from us as a result of coronaphobia? No. It may be similarly destructive, but if you look at the curve of, of, of that tyranny of the drug war uh, now coming to an end, it was because of the asymmetrical nature of the information war and the fact that you couldn't well if a government agent came to your town and said marijuana is bad it's going to make everybody go crazy it's going to make white women want to fuck black men and wow. we should all be very very afraid that was the problem what are you going to say whoa me that you know the history babe you know that this you know this no, I was, that was a real thing I, that was how they got I people to support so cannabis did. prohibition she just valley. tuned into that and thought i was saying yeah. it right yeah, don't take I that line was, out of context no, I was but uh <laughs> yeah so if um you have that information asymmetry, it takes a long time to overcome that because people buy into it. People are lied to. There's ways of moving money to reinforce that and, and entrench that. 
in the world we live in today, if uh, I, I don't think the drug war would be possible. First of all, think about it. If if we had um, cannabis now just becoming a thing, becoming popular, and society was looking at like, what is this thing? Is it bad? Is it good? Is it is it harmful? And the government was trying to make it illegal. They'd have a really hard time with all the scientific evidence about how safe and, and healthy it is and helpful it is making it illegal at this point. Uh, so all of these these tyrannies, all of the, the, the government abuse of power that comes from series of events like this uh, depend on a kind of information asymmetry and, and a time asymmetry that's closing now. The government can't keep things like this on a large scale secret for very long. So um, Ryan Ramsey points out, no, it was weed and guns were banned by racists. Take it from me, I used to be one, yes. And for everybody who doesn't know, Ryan Ramsey, one of, one of my favorite former racists, someone who's come a long way in overthrowing- How do you get to say that? One of my favorite former racists, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, <laughs> Well, no, Ryan is, is really a great example of someone who's, who's embraced the love of libertarianism to recognize the universality of the human experience and, and, and overcome his racial conditioning and biases to have, uh, you know, cast off that paradigm. Uh, but he pointed out, yeah, guns and, and weed were made illegal by racists. Yeah. Yeah, originally gun control was, uh, and it's obviously I'm saying guns are illegal. I know, you know they're illegal for me, uh, but even that is a racist policy. Why are guns illegal for me? Because I'm a felon. Guess what? There are a lot more felons proportionally among black Americans than white Americans, surprise, surprise. And the original uh, aims of gun control policy, gun control, were to keep guns away from black Americans. So I, I'm, I'm pretty confident, and, and, and the question really, how, how do we fight this in a serious way? Once, once we see that these powers have been taken by government, how do we fight back localization? You know, yes, education, information, and uh, you know, dispelling all of these lies of government is really important, but in terms of practical policy to shift us away from the system in a meaningful way and take away the power from centralized authority that they never should have had in the first place, the answer is localization, localization, localization. That's how we transition government to being voluntary, customized, transparent, and accountable. All right. Stephen Powell, felon is the new black. What else, babe? Um, so we can wrap this up. Time to go. We'll get okay. back on the road to our bug out spot. Uh, well, I got one more question, oh, yeah. and then I do have a comment to add to my ibuprofen thing. So the last question is, do you think there will be a, a big uptake in homeschooling from now on? Yeah. Uh, you know, right we, oh, yeah, yesterday, on yeah, yesterday, yesterday, we we wanted to focus on all the silver linings and and, and positive and things coming out of that, and uh, yeah, but I didn't really get into it yesterday. I think this is great, and I got I got to hand it to Arvind Vora, although I think he's wrong with a number of things, uh, but but especially his uh, position related to uh, the, the coronaphobia. But um, he's he's very much jumping on this opportunity as someone who provides homeschooling services and and tutoring services to uh to get that out uh more readily available so hey if, if you don't know arvin vora he's one of our fellow libertarian party presidential candidates and um he is on Facebook. It's V O H R A Vora A R V I N Arvin Arvin Vora. You can find him. You can find um, shoot his website is escaping me now. But you can find him from his name. It's like Vorha Method, right? Um, v O H R A. V O H R A Arvin Vorha. And yeah, I want really want to give him a shout out uh, for for at least one thing, and that's his work in challenging the government education paradigm. Very very important to moving humanity forward. And uh, you know the homeschooling thing right now, it's it's definitely a, a good side effect of coronaphobia that uh, parents are sort of forced by circumstance to take care of their children at home. Um, well, you know, uh, our friend Marcus Poulos, who is our press secretary, works for a school for his, his main job uh, and has been furloughed for a month. His daughter is at home doing work on a school curriculum from, from the internet. Mm -hmm. And I think it's going to be a really powerful lesson for a lot of kids and a lot of parents. Hey, 
this gets better when we don't send you to a government prison building to be educated. Uh, and and I, I, I could rant for another hour, although, like I said, Arvin's probably done a better job than I could on this, on all of the ills of the government education system and they are deep and pervasive and, and maybe the government didn't realize how much they were giving up in terms of control of our children's minds by sending everyone home like this and uh, the Ron Paul curriculum also uh, I hope is seeing a big surge in demand there so uh, yeah inevitably you are going to have a major shift towards homeschooling as a, uh, a part of the legacy of uh, Corona phobia. So, your uh, your last point, dear. Um, so David G. Green did make a great point um, after I spoke a little bit about ibuprofen, and he said, "Don't take Tylenol or aspirin either unless your fever is at a dangerous level. They do lower your body temperature. Fever is your immune system's way of killing the virus. Embrace the discomfort." To which Ryan Ramsey uh, replied, embrace discomfort is pretty much the description of always to become strong. So I thought I just wanted to put that out there too. Don't go out pill, pill pop in Tylenol just because a bunch of French quacks with no scientific basis say ibuprofen is going to spread the, uh, the virus. So. Yeah, absolutely. And as always, make your own health decisions by choice, by doing your own research. And if you are feeling ill right now, and I mean, I would say this uh, at any point, but especially now, uh, don't do things for your body, to your body, put things in your body out of a knee-jerk response. Well, this is what I did last time when I was sick or whatever. If you do think that, you, that you're getting coronavirus, uh, do a little research on, the, on you know, what's best for treating your symptoms. But from everything that we've seen, and I, again, before you put anything in your body, make sure you know what's going on. Uh, but from everything we've seen, most people who get this, it's extremely mild. No second thought is really even necessary for treating it. You know, you, you take care of your symptoms. And, you know, if you have a stuffy nose, you take a decongestant, um, you know, m maybe some Benadryl. I know it's allergies, but it helps for a lot of cold symptoms as well. Um, and, and I think your point about the fever is, is, is important. If, if you're experiencing low-level symptoms, low-level treatment, not a big deal. CBD. If you get, yeah, CBD. If you get into any more significant symptoms right now while there's this threat of some other possibility, and, you know, I'm, the, the one threat that I, that I haven't heard much of is that some young people, um, oh, by the way, like one of the headlines fear-mongering was, um, surge of cases among young people in Italy and it was like three what like uh, yeah and they were all and then the other headline that came out of Italy uh, you know uh, countering the fear I, I hope uh, said that 99% of the deaths in Italy were people with pre-existing conditions mm -hmm. and you go oh okay that's what that's what's really going on here and anytime you have this information asymmetry, this misinformation, this fear mongering, things are going to get blown up out of proportion. But if you have anything serious going on with your health, you know, do your research, get online. WebMD is a great resource. Um, although some people tell me it's biased. Naturalnews.com, although it seems Mike Adams there, my friend, is, is, is blowing up the thread a little bit more, although me, he's, he's generally on the side. <laughs> ask mom. T call your mom. If, you're, hey, <laughs> if mom. you feel symptoms persisting for more than 48 hours, call your mother immediately. Well, my mother worked at the Center of Allergy and Immunology at UCSD as a lead researcher for 14 years. So if anybody wants to ask me questions, she's homeopathic and holistic as of now, and you uses CBD for almost everything. She studied viruses and how they work and how to cure them for 14 years. So if anyone has questions, feel free to direct message me. Well, and I would say call a doctor also. And if you are experiencing any kind of uncertainty, that. but yeah, you got to be really careful with that too, because well, I'm not, yeah. So you said before they start recording and reporting. Yeah, there's a chance you. that uh, we see some of the scarier headlines now. The NSA is looking to get phone information to be able to track people, stuff like that. And for yeah. Stephen so, Powell, who said WebMD is in government propaganda. Oh, is government? You don't know, no, no, it is. You know, it yeah, is, no, it's definitely yeah. establishment, don't, but don't it's good knowledge. WebMD Challenge it, question it. Type in 
cough and end up with lung cancer for like no reason. So yes, I was gonna. <laughs> okay. I've used WebMD with good I, results. I use, I use there are better the, resources. Results also, but I also occasionally get those. I typed in my symptoms. Check your information. Yeah, yes, yes. I, like I typed in my symptoms and got prostate cancer. Question. So <laughs> yeah, and I was pregnant. <laughs> yeah, question everything and, uh, and, and make smart decisions for yourself. Keep your head about you. Don't be intimidated into losing your cool. Stay cool, calm, and collected. <laughs> And we will talk to you right here, same bad time tomorrow. Peace and love, y'all.